Hi everyone, thank you for being here tonight. This is the third in a series of panels held in conjunction with Steady Retcon, Syracuse University School of Visual and Performing Arts 2022 MFA thesis exhibition curated by Lord Vorkin. The show is on view now until May 15th at the SU Art Museum in the Schaefer Art Building and the Point of Contact in Jeanette Galleries at the Warehouse in downtown Syracuse. I wanted to share with you all the curatorial statement. Traditionally, a literary and cinematic technique, retcon, is the abbreviation of retroactive continuity and refers to a new piece of information introduced to a story that alters the interpretation of a previously established narrative. Retcon is not just employed in a fictional context, read in a book or viewed on a screen, but experienced in the world around us. In the current climate, we are absorbing new information constantly, like it or not, and it is challenging the way we see everything day to day, hour to hour. Our internal database is developing at record speed. What was recognized as commonplace merely a year ago is being re-examined and at times by the entire world in unison. The artists in this exhibition are evaluating and reframing their personal histories, traditional standards of art making, and history as a whole. While in everyday life, the constant introduction of so-called facts and opinions appear erratic, the investigations held within the artworks in the exhibition are much more intentional, slower paced, steady. They are careful and curious assessments removed from the web of media into meticulously presented ideas. With that, I wanna share with you the artist's bios. Sharon Zhou was born in Beijing, China, 1997. She makes wearable objects using mainly glass, beads to address commonplace stereotypes towards women's social roles and aims at advocating women's autonomy. Sharon's work has been exhibited internationally in Spain, China, United States, as well as various online exhibitions. Mike Kalish, born 1964, spent his childhood outside Albany, New York. He discovered an interest in making sculpture during his first semester of college long ago. An intervening lifetime returned Kalish to upstate New York into the organized pursuit of art. A student of Affordis's, our sensitivities still confound him. Ting Kang, born 1998, Beijing, China, received her BFA in Environmental and Interior Design from Syracuse University in 2020 and is now pursuing her MFA in Design. She works interdisciplinary, utilizing a service design thinking strategy, and she has a great passion for painting, biodesign, art therapy, etc. Ting is also the president of the SU Badminton Club. Zuzu grew up in a family with artistic tradition, so art looked appealing to her when she was a child. She decided to choose her art as, as undergraduate study major as well as her life career. In 2018, Zuzu came to the U.S. and began to learn computer art. During this time, she started to try new ways to show her concept in her work. She makes experimental animation and some sculptures in her MFA degree. My name's Devin and I'm happy to be hosting this panel tonight. I'm an art historian and museum professional specializing in contemporary art. I love getting to talk to artists about their work and I work in collections at the Syracuse University Art Museum as well as Fridman Gallery where I act as a liaison between collectors and artists. With that, I'm excited to hear from our artists. So first up, Sharon, your work is in the SU Art Museum. So I would love you to introduce our audience to it. Yeah, so um, for this MFA show that's currently on view in the SU Art Museum, I have three series. Um, two of them are my previous works that I created um, during my three years in the program here. And one of them, um, which is titled here, is my thesis work. So um, yeah, so even though the other two are like my old works, but I, I'm happy to talk about them 
too, because my works, well, throughout the three years, my works has been pretty consistent uh, conceptually. So yeah, that's, and my works are mainly made out of seed beads. I believe that's pretty obvious if uh, you have seen it in person. And that's the main material that I'm currently super obsessed with. And the concept or the ideas of my work has always been about um, feminism and women's rights in terms of reproduction. And also my practice is kind of a way that I cope with my own relationship with my mother. So I have been having a confrontational relationship with my mother. And since we're both women, it brought me really into the topic of women's rights and uh, the assumed or the commonly perceived women's social roles in the society. So that's the main focus of my practice overall. And in my previous works, uh, the ideas of them all derive from the confrontational part or the neg negativity of our like, relationship. But for my thesis work, it's kind of different because I kind of want to stop talking about the negativity in our relationship. So uh, in my statement for my thesis work, I wrote that it's a piece uh, it's a gift for my mother. And I do want to address this in a vastly different way than I used to do it in the past. And yeah, it turns, it, it has turned way more personal than my former works. And yeah, that's pretty much all I have for now. You talked about the beads and the material they use. How did you um, find that material and how did you get started working with it? Yeah, so the starting point was the pandemic actually, because I major in jewelry and metalsmithing. We are super dependent on the studio space and the equipment, the facilities we have in the studio. So I think it was in about March, 2020, the pandemic hit and we lost all the access to the studio and we, are, we were locked down in our apartments. Even though I had some supplies and tools for jewelry making, it wasn't really a good condition for me to keep practicing the same techniques that I am comfortable with in my studio. So I started, um, shifting my focus to some other materials that are more domestically friendly. And I was also influenced by Liza Liu's work, uh, her famous work named Kitchen. So yeah, that was my shift or the turning point of my practice. So I thought, Hmm, maybe I can try something like this because it's easy and it's time consuming, which makes it a perfect way to kill time during the quarantine and also make art. So it's really perfect for that condition. And also I relate to, I relate the property of the material to women's social status because the seed beads, they're, they have been underrated in the industry. It has been regarded as a um, hobbyist crafty material for amateur people who are not artists, but are just interested in making something simple and look like art. So I do think it's underestimated in some way. And I do think it has some associations with my own concept of my practice. So I started working with the seed beads and yeah, see where it got me. It's like, it's been an amazing uh, journey with like shifting the materials and really finding the path that I'm truly passionate about. So 
do you think that um, you see yourself creating with the beads in the future now? Or do you think there's a different um, material or medium that you want to start exploring in your in your practice? Or do you think you're going to keep with that? Yeah, I do think mostly I want to stick with uh, the beads as maybe like the main material, but I'm also super open to other crafts and other materials because in my works, uh, I incorporated uh, metal with the beads and sometimes other things with the beads. And that contrast uh, is really interesting to me, like the contrast of the different properties between different materials and how that can help me evolve the concept and my practice. Um, yeah, and also it's kind of interesting that metalsmithing is usually perceived as a, a relatively masculine craft and beading or beadwork is usually perceived as a more um, like feminine kind of technique. Um, and I, like in terms of the gender aspect that I have been always talking about in my practice, I do think that's very interesting to me. And along each project, I work with the seed beads. I will always uh, discover some other interesting aspect of this same material. And that keeps me going like further and further. So yeah, uh, I, I, I look forward to seeing what the seed beads can bring me in the future. Yeah. Awesome, well, thank you for sharing with us. Um, so your work is at SU Art. Mm -hmm. So now let's hear from Mike a little bit about um, your sculptural works and the works that you have in Point of Contact. That's right. The work's up at point of contact. The um, the work that I'm showing is uh, kind of autobiographical in nature, it, it, which corresponds to the trajectory of my um, MFA. I'd say so. I I took the I I'm a full time and professor at SU uh, in the psychology department. So I completed my MFA part time, and it took me about nine years. And over that course of that nine years, quite a bit happened. Um, the first thing is that the relevant to the to the work, the two things that are relevant to the work that happened, um, where I, I uh, my method of working is very spontaneous and um, meditative, um, but it's also been highly intellectualized. So it's a very uh, there's a lot of thought goes into trying to make work without thinking too much about the work I'm making. So a kind of a non-thinking right action sort of approach to working. Um, but then at the, in 2018, um, um, my wife died, and that uh, really blew me up uh, very badly. My whole practice kind of shifted. So the, the work I was doing, um, the, the methods I was using were the same, but it were, I was unable to, to resolve anything into a piece of work uh, I, um, due to all sorts of reasons. And then I came to encaustic painting and um, ink drawing. And so I've I found those to be a really um, spontaneous and, and effective way at getting out some of the issues that I was trying confronting in my inability to get the sculptures to resolve. And then we had the pandemic. So um, just as I was coming, we are coming around, we re, I, getting back to the studio, the studio closed, I started growing a beard. So this is my pandemic beard. Um, it started exactly in, in March of 2020. And we lost access to the studio, as Sharon pointed out. And then um, uh, I lost access to my home studio when my son lost his job. That was, I guess, the third thing. Uh, and so uh, what, what happened was a, a, just a real feeling of disconnection and, um, and defamiliarization with, uh, with the whole prospect of working. Um, and so what I produced was, a, was what, what I found was that um, I could take my, my sort of intellectual uh, attempts at understanding my art and replace those with a more um, emotive attempt to understand the work and to draw from myself kind of the, the nature of my feeling at the point of construction. 
And so I what I what I found was that there's uh, so which which was nice. It produced the kind of uh, was able to generate work um, up to a certain point. And so the the when the prompt came to do the MFA installation. Um, that ended up being really positive for me because I was able to resolve a bunch of these issues in a single kind of coherent piece. So I, it starts on the left with uh, the time before my wife died when there's some organization and uh, sense it to, to, my, to myself. And then there's the, the lacuna, the gap and the absence representing with um, Martha's loss and this, the eeriness of that because of her constant presence. You know, it's when you lose your wife, She's never really gone, um, only not there. So the the and then the last panel is the is the that sense of of energy without purpose. So that's that's what's showing at the gallery right now. It's um it's it's yeah, there you go. That's what's there. Yeah. So um, how has the MFA kind of influenced or, or changed your your practice? I know you you went back to it. Were you creating before then, and then you decided that you wanted to kind of do the MFA, or was it? Yeah, yeah. I could. It's a good question. Excellent question. The 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 there's a there's a, a pragmatic answer and a re, and maybe a more a deeper answer. So the pragmatic answer is if you work at SU, you get to take a class for free. I took a, a, a took a jam class with um, the, the the professor who was teaching it um, at the time, and and they were lovely, and so I got hooked, and and so I took the program. Uh, that's one reason. The other is that I I've been uh, I I've I've been pining for the for the art degree I never got when I was in college. So when I I was denied my my um, bachelor of art by not taking one credit course and paying an outrageous fee to the private university I was attending. In order to get it, so so it, part of what the MFA has done for me to answer your question is um, in a world of uh, so it's it's provided me with the opportunity to legitimize my own practice. So I've always been sort of very amateur, um, engaged, amateur thinking about things, and it's the MFA gave me a chance to develop my sense of my aesthetic to the point where I feel confident about it as much as one can. But oddly, it did very little to change my practice. So the, the work that I'm making now is very much in line with the kind of work I was making in the past. Um, you know, I, you could make jokes about not being able to teach an old dog new tricks, and that may be true. Um, I'm fairly set in my ways, um, maybe even stubborn, but, I, but the MFA has been great for me in terms of understanding what it is I'm doing. Yeah, definitely. And I think that a lot of the times, maybe some artists shy away from MFAs because they do fear that it will change their practice in a way they don't want, but it sounds like, you know, that's up to the artists and certainly it sounds like the program as well. So, well, there, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, there is a lot of pressure to like explore, think, yeah, think, is this really what you want to be making? But when it's like, when sometimes you keep falling back into that same space and it, that doesn't mean it's bad, it just means it's your space. So that's right. Of course. So it seems like your artistic journey has kind of been informed by a lot of these turning points in your life. Where do you see um, your work going after this? That is a really excellent question. Um, uh, I don't know. I guess wherever my life goes, that's the the, the mystery. Um, I'm hoping to, to be able to harness some of the energy that I've been had access to as a result of the profound grief that I had, the, I mean, that emotional strength or the, the strength of that emotion, but harness some of the strength of emotions that aren't necessarily, that aren't connected to grief. So can I find something to make work about? That's, that's what the future holds for me. Awesome. Yeah, no, that seems like um, going forward, like it, it really is just, you seem very, um, proud of like the work that you've done and I hope that it continues. Oh, well, thanks. I mean, I don't think, I think I don't know any other way to make things. So I have to keep making things the same way. <laughs> you mentioned earlier that it's meditative for you. And I imagine the area that you teach um, is informed by that. Is there, I, I teach as well. And I know that my students, they really make me see things differently. It, have you had that kind of experience of your students and maybe applying that onto your work or them changing your perspective, anything like that? 
Um, that's really fascinating. Now, this, so I teach uh, cognitive psychology. I teach a lot of statistics and research methods. And um, so, so I have worked, and, uh, but I also teach computer science, uh, computer programming, artificial intelligence, that kind of thing. Um, and I've worked really hard to keep all of that as far away from my art as possible. So I put a firewall between intellectual mic and aesthetic mic. Mm -hmm. and, and part of this process has been a slow collapse of that firewall. But, but the firewall is really strong because um, it just gets, I think I would be really boring as an artist if you talk to, to scientist Mike. He's not, it, and so the, the, um, the inspiration from, uh, I think there, there is one strong place of inspiration. So I will say that part of my uh, research, part of my research is as a psychologist is in the philosophy of psychology. So I'm interested in what is the, what the nature of psychological explanation is. And what that carries is how do we communicate? What's the, what is it to, to share an idea, a thought or a feeling with someone in language or not in language? Um, what does that mean? And so I think a lot about that. I don't think, I, I think a lot about it from a Wittgensteinian perspective. Um, how, do, how do we uh, participate in the hurly burly of our lives and, and, uh, and from that become human? I think that's, you know, I, there's nothing in my, in my psychology career that prepared me for that at all, because I have never studied that kind of psychology. I've only ever studied the science kind. So the, the um, disconnect for me is between the, the approaching the world as a scientist and approaching the world as an artist. And, and what I've been kind of uh, dumbfolded to, to find in the last few years, last year really, is the strength, the, the degree of difference in that approach. Um, it's, it's quite it's quite surprising to me, and I'm not really sure what to make of it. So I'm reconsidering my understanding of both of those things. Do you find that the artist you and the scientific you, that it's impressive that you put up a divide, but do you think that they clash at, at certain times? Uh, no, I think it's just, it's just ways of expressing creativity. So so my I guess I would say that my you know my meditative process is all about channeling creativity into a very small number of options. So the, the um, enameling, electroforming, fold forming, there, those, there's an array of tools that are available. That spectrum of possibilities is then the avenue for the exploitation of my creativity. And, and that's just a really different way of acting than when I exploit my creativity as a scientist, where I try to be creative in, a, in, a deep, in an intellectual and programmatic way, as opposed to a spontaneous and emotive way. Right. Definitely. Well, I wanted to thank you so much for sharing. Well, thanks. Research. Thank you. Um, and next, let's hear from Ting about your work. I know you have your sculptural piece and a lot of your inspiration from, for it came from stress. So if you want to go over your piece a little bit and then delve into that. All right. Um, hello, my name is Ting Kane, a second year MFA design student. Um, my work is now exhibiting in the Point of Contact Gallery. Um, so my design thesis explore an intervention that alleviate academic stress among 18 to 19 year old adolescents through the use of natural elements in, tier, uh, in, in indoor spaces. So I was into um, stress related topic because I grown up in Beijing, China where students are facing so many different um, like difficult tasks and competitions. And I believe students all over the world, um, especially in high achievement schools are also facing different, like um, different levels of academic stress. Um, and on the other hand, because of my environmental and interior design background during my undergrad um, at SU, I started to seek for a connection between the built environment and nature. Um, since we know that nature plays such a, um, important role in releasing our mental stress. Um, so last semester I have done survey and co-creation co workshop, um, get to know users needs. And I started to know that students are spending more time indoors because of their academic responsibilities. And some of them complain about like, they're not able to relax just in time since they cannot just like express their feelings after running back to their dorms or like go out where there's a lot of people around. 
And what, what is most interesting to me is that there's an example that a new student once come to me at the Smith Hall where I usually work. And she asked me that if there's a quiet space that, can, that she can stay, um, you know, all we can suggest is the Bird Library, but actually this is a place for work, you know. So eventually I came up with um, this natural based pod concept mm -hmm. that can be located around on our campus. Um, so my prototype is formed by less than a hundreds of triangular modules. Um, they're being laser cutted and has four notches on each of them. So it's easier for construction. And I tested this model twice um, already in both Schaefer Art Gallery and the Bird Library. And during the testing, I recruited students and passersby to experience the pod. And I also had them wear an Apple Watch to detect their heart rate um, because you know heart, heart rate is often a great um, indicator for stress. And there were not only visual and tactile experiences uh, within the pod um, that you can not only like see or like touch the plants, but also there are like natural smell um, and natural based music that I provided the AirPod that you, you can like listen to music. Um, so all of these enhance an overall pod experience. And this pod could also be seen as a product as I expected. So in order to meet different adolescents needs, they can be built in different sizes, themes, different levels of closeness, um, maybe with different plants and the site could be different as well. Um, like they can be put into airport, um, like barn center, academic buildings, um, shopping malls, kindergartens, etc. So that adolescents and like people at all ages could relax just in time and also provide them with a private space um, within such a public environment. And what I haven't shown on my physical model, uh, but still part of my design uh, will include a dripping, like a drip irrigation system that could help the plants to self-sustain. And most importantly, in terms of speculative uh, biodesign, the spaces could also involve like robotic plant-human interactions. Um, since I just mentioned that human heart rate is often an indicator for stress. So linking this data to um, the plant behavior in response to stimuli could also be a way to address stress levels. And in this way, I want to envision um, like a very large system that facilitates um, the human plant reactions with surface mounted electrodes and chips on the plants to receive and reflect human stress signals. Um, well, in this way, there will be like um, real time biofeedback between the users who are sitting in the pot and also um, the natural elements within the pot. So for example, when um, something that you can imagine about uh, when the environment detects stress levels, um, maybe from like a sensor on, on your hand um, and also a connection on the pipe, they can uh, sense your stress levels through those sensors and the plants with robotic base that can slowly turn towards you and create the user a more enclosure and private space. So that's, yeah, that's all. Awesome, thanks for sharing that. Do you think that um, in the future, you'll kind of want to try to get these sort of spaces implemented in, you know, around maybe SSU's campus or the other places you mentioned, like you want to continue on with this project? Um, yes, definitely. I'm trying to like get fundings. Um, you know, like I have already tested this pod twice in Bird Library and Schaefer Art Building, and I get a lot of responses. And if I got more findings, I will definitely like put into um, like at those irrigation systems or um, I can do more testing about the robotic um, like plant, human, like human interactions to put those like uh, chips if it's necessary. And also from a product perspective, um, I can put them into like different places, not only on campus, but also in like other commercial areas. Um, from a service design point of view. Yeah. 
so I know that you have the object um, displayed, but do you want to talk about some of the other materials in the gallery? Like I know you have the panels and the video that kind of, um, how did you go about documenting it? Um, so I, I did different surveys, um, collecting a lot of data. And um, so in the gallery, I now I have like two panels um, explaining, briefly explaining my work. And also the pod is there. You can definitely try like sitting within. Um, it's pretty relaxing. And also above the pod, there's my explain, explanation video uh, about six minutes long. Um, you can definitely know more about what I did during the process and what like, my future goal is. And since my thesis defense is on May 9th, I will definitely put like a larger panel with like much more details in it. Um, so you can definitely see that after. Yeah. Yeah, so I know that you talked a little bit about just hearing from different students, but is there any um, person or like outside mentor that's kind of um, impacted your process and impacted your work? Mm, right, because um, I mentioned that I'm from Beijing uh, and have been like went through so many like academic stress and also I think my father it's the one that inspired me a lot because he's a um biotech a biotech professor in uh, Beijing First University so like he encouraged me to because I'm a big fan of art I do art since four so I he encouraged me to like to, like major in design during my undergrad um, and then also connecting that the built in environment and biology is also like part of his um, academics, like um, study field. So I feel like that's pretty amazing to me. And yeah, he's such an important person in my like the whole career life, whole study life, you know? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and yeah, thinking about like maybe the spaces in Beijing that you could implement the, the project. Yes, definitely, definitely. Um, so with this project, are there other projects that you're working on simultaneously too? Or um, was this the main focus? Cause it was, you know, your thesis one. Well, um, so this thesis has been focusing, uh, like has been processing for a, a year already. Um, because we need to like uh, go through the IRB process, um, like um, including recruit people, which is so hard. Um, and also the pot making process is so long because we need to like, I, I need to cut like laser cut those like pieces yeah. and then construct them and then um, in different sites. Um, well, during this two year um, grad study, I also did a a lot of other project as well because like MFA design it's so interdisciplinary that we just find a problem and then use so many different uh, ways to like address this problem so uh, we just had something like um, uh, prevent falling among old, like elder people um, and also we had like um, UI UX design related stuff like creating a um, like a training app regarding um, like economic, economics, something like that. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm excited to see where this project goes and these pods and places in the future. But thank you for sharing your, your project with us, Ting. So now we'll hear from Zuzu about your work it's in um, the SUR Museum in the Schaefer Art Building. And I know you have kind of three different um, pieces of your work there. So if you wanna talk about those three. Okay, yeah. Well, hi, I'm Zuzu, I'm from Computer Art. And there are three of my pieces uh, at SU Art Gallery right now. And one is 2D animation project named the CR Zuo Token in Cuba Fly. And the other one is about, uh, is, is a installation named um, Smart Swing Law. And the last one is uh, all you can tell them the empty. Yeah, actually, the last one love is my pieces. I did it. Uh, my piece I did in 2019. Yeah, and it it focuses on 
the relationship with um, with my partner. During the time I was with my partner, he changed me a lot. Uh, he made me lost myself uh, and hurt my confidence. I always felt and uh, denied myself at that time. And so I made this piece to heal myself and to help me fold my identity. I want to visualize the um, controlling and my feelings um, in, in this piece, yeah. Um, and in this piece, I, I use the red yarn to represent the controlling and when the yarn is tightly wrapped uh, around the pillow, it gives me uh, gives audience a very strong sense of the controlling and I wanted to highlight the feeling of the the love and the pain uh, so I finally decided to use the red red yarn present so uh, represent controlling uh, this work made me aware of establishment of my concept exploring um, the paradigm Toxical uh, dynamics of intimacy and uh, uh, where forms of bondage and control are entwined with love and freedom. Yeah, and uh, in this year, I want to uh, find out the reasons for my intimate relationship and uh, explore my crea creations. So I push myself deeper and deeper, and I realized. Um, my relationship with my father was the motivation for my work. My father was an artist before, uh, but whenever my father saw me painting, he always broke my paintbrushes in my childhood. And also he told me that I couldn't make a career out of art. So um, my father prevented me from studying art and denied my all affirmation of many things. He forced me, I. Uh, his idea onto me, which caused me to lost myself beginning in the childhood. So I I, I described myself to my closest um is attempt attempt beef. Yeah, in the face of the op oppressive behavior, I always chose to conform uh compromise. However, the operation resulting from long term um, relationship with my father and my partner largely destroyed me. So um, I want to, um, so this is the motivation um, for my own work is about the controlling, yeah. Uh, so art seemed to be the bridge between me and my father. My conflict with him unfolded from art, not only about that. So his position in my family is as if he's the president, just like the chairman. So in my thesis project, uh, yeah, the to the animation part, yeah, I I use the a uh, chair to represent my father, yeah, and uh, I use the butterfly to represent myself. Uh, so yeah, I did uh to the animation to to describe the our relationship, yeah, um, yeah. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. So you worked with three very different materials. Um, did you plan that or did you kind of start with the animation and then it inspired the installation or the painting? Or did they all they were all planned that way? Oh uh, yeah, actually the empty the empty is uh oil painting. I I, I painted uh empty chair on the board so it's related to my to my 2d animation part so it's a yeah the same one i think right and then i i noticed in your animation kind of the the kind of yarn is kind of it connects to the installation right yeah 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 so uh actually i think uh, um my relationships is really same yeah, because um, um, I I told you before I um, my relationship with my father and my partner largely destroyed me a lot. So, and uh, it is kind of the reason. I mean, uh, the reason I did this thesis project 
because I I um I the small sort of love is kind of the reason of of why I want to explore my concept. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I remember when you were doing install and I was kind of walking around and I was looking at how you were hanging the installation and then cutting the yarn. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you decided to lay them out and, and what it was like installing them? Uh, yeah. Uh, actually, I used to nail to, yeah, hang, hanging the wall. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, and the Dylan helped me a lot. So yeah, this is my actually the small screen love uh is my first installation piece. So mm -hmm. and it's the only only one, yeah, I think. Yeah, that's great that you know the museum was able to help you kind of brainstorm because I think when artists have installation work, it's really important to be exhibited how you want it to be shown and, and less so um, maybe people that are, that are helping you. So I always, I'm a really big advocate for artists being a part of that process as much as possible because I think it really, um, it's just an extension of your artistic vision. So do you think um, this kind of theme and these relationships um, is something you're going to continue to explore? Or is there a different subject area that you're wanting to go into now? Uh, actually, for now, I come out of these relationships. So I just, uh, um, I, I think, yeah, the this piece is kind of the for me uh, heal myself a lot. Yeah, uh, I just uh, mm, represent art as my weapon. Yeah, and can fight with darkness. Yeah, so I I came out from out of these relationships. Yeah, for now. So yeah, uh, yeah. No, go ahead. Uh, oh yeah. So uh, for uh, in the future, I want to explore more relationship with others. I'm, yeah, so not not only with my father or partners, yeah. Right, definitely. Yeah, it sounds like it's definitely kind of been meditative for you in a way to work, you know, through those things. And I think that's really important. And I think um, your work is really representative of that. And I think people looking at it too, like it, it, I remember I watched your animation for the first time and it's really like emotional and you feel something, even if I didn't know all the context behind your work, but it's it's really moving um, seeing it in, in that space. So I encourage you all to go see all of these works in person if you are able to. And yeah, I, I wanted to thank you guys for joining us tonight. And I think this was a really wonderful discussion. I'm so excited to talk to you all and hear about your work. So these um, shows are gonna be on view until May 15th, um, again, at the SU Art Museum in the Schaefer Art Building and Point of Contact in Jeanette Galleries at the Warehouse, which are in downtown Syracuse. And then this Thursday, so in two days, um, April 21st, there will be a reception at the Jeanette Gallery from five to seven. And I think all the artists will be there. So I hope to see all of you guys there and hopefully our audience members as well. But thank you again to our artists and I hope that everybody has a good night. Thank you.